Welcome back to the Get Loved Up podcast, your number one resource for inspiration and motivation to live your purpose, make healthy living a priority, and thrive doing what you love. I'm your host, Koya Webb, a small town girl who chased her dreams and caught them, a former track and field athlete who healed using spirituality and yoga, and an entrepreneur who didn't let sexual assault racism and insecurities dim her light. And now it's your turn to allow these episodes with some of the top voices in spirituality, wellness, and entrepreneurship to inspire you to thrive. Let's get loved up together. Javon Caceres is the author of Reclaiming Wellness and a certified wellness expert, integrative herbalist, nutrition educator, and coach. She offers lectures and workshops worldwide in Spanish and English. Javon studied nutrition with best-selling author T. Colin Campbell, PhD, at his Center for Nutrition Studies in partnership with Cornell University, and herbalism plant medicines with Tarona Lodog, MD. She is a native of Puerto Rico and currently resides in Los Angeles. Javanka, <laughs> thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. I can't wait to delve in. Uh, I am just so excited to talk about all things wellness, especially on the Get Loved Up podcast. Our favorite, favorite, favorite topics are when it comes to wellness. And you just authored a book, Reclaiming Wellness, which I am so excited about diving into. And I guess the the number one thing that I want to kind of just start with is just kind of your wellness journey and how you started into wellness to where you are today. Yeah. So once again, thank you for having me. Uh, My journey towards wellness started similarly to a lot of other people who got sick and were trying to find solutions. So for those of you who don't know, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico in the tropics, uh, living with, you know, eating from my neighbor's mango tree and homemade foods and exposure to nature and the oceans. And I moved to New York to go to school and walked away from that lifestyle and into the hustle of New York City and fast food restaurants restaurants and sneakers bars <laughs> and my body rebelled. So I was a relatively young person with conditions that thankfully were not life threatening, but were chronic and acute in nature. They were IBS, endometriosis, I had fibroids, I had ulcers, a handful of them in my stomach. And by Western medicine standards, those conditions are considered non-curable. They're chronic, they're supposed to be handled, and you're supposed to struggle with them for the rest of your life. And as a 24, 25-year-old, that wasn't acceptable to me, so I went elsewhere. And I started learning about things like traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda and Western herbalism. I changed my diet, and then when I started doing that, my body started to adjust started to restore balance and heal. And it became this new passion in my life. I was climbing the corporate ladder. I was in the music industry, nothing to do with wellness. But this journey became a big passion. And I decided to leave my job to become an educator. And I've been doing this now for 10 years. Wow, that's so incredible. And so, and we are so glad to have you because you have done so much resource. Um, You are so resourced and you've done so much research on really the origins of wellness. And I really love that because I'm a firm believer and, you know, well-being has been here since the beginning of time. And we're constantly getting downloads on how we should live so that we can thrive during whatever time we're in. So can you talk a little bit about your passion um, behind writing the book and what really inspired you to write it? Yeah, you know, you are one of those people that, and I have a handful of other friends that are women of color in the world world of wellness doing amazing work, but that was not as ubiquitous when I first started. You didn't see a lot of people of color in yoga classes or in wellness conferences. And then that actually led to the beginning of the pandemic when I started to see in the news all these these stories about how people of color and or um, people in of social of certain socioeconomic backgrounds 
were struggling with COVID and other pre-existing conditions more than other people. And I realized this information needs to be out there to, to a lot of people that sound and look like me. And once you start realizing that, you realize, oh my God, wait a minute, this is ours to reclaim. This is mm. part of our ancestry, part of our birthright. And it's important that we learn about it. So I started to, re- to, to wonder, how do I get people excited about learning about it? It's true that once you get to learn something, you learn to love it. And once you learn to love it, it's easier to implement. So I decided to write this book as an homage to my own ancestry, but also to remind people that in your ancestor, in your ancestry lineage, chances are you're going to have some of these practices. And it's important that we reclaim them in order to reclaim our natural and our rightful state of wellness. Ashe, so true, so true. I love that. And I think, you know, what you mentioned in the book is that a lot of people think, oh, that's not for me, that's for someone else, you know, and really uh, all of us originating out of Egypt have these well being practices. And as we see ourselves emerging in different parts of the world, depending on what part of the world you're in, you develop your own practices based on the culture and the climate and things like that and and what nature provided you. So can you, one of my favorite parts of the book is where you just really break down some of the different, I guess, um, now mainstream practices that we do and where they originated from. So can you share with our listeners is like some of the things you really unpacked and found out for yourself. Yeah, so the book explores seven categories of wellness and within each of those categories, you'll find a handful of practices. And once I started researching, it became very obvious that a lot of these practices came from all over the world. For thousands of years, people have been using them. So the the perfect example is the practice, the, the chapter on oil heat and water, then you look at pretty much everywhere in the world, the the shamans of South America, the the healers of Africa, North and South Africa, the people in Northern Europe and Asia and other parts of the world, all of them use the combination of oil, heat and water to achieve wellness, to attain spiritual enlightenment. And it was just a lovely, lovely way to discover some of these practices. One of the ones that actually got me the most excited was learning. You mentioned the ancient Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians, they had it going on. They knew exactly (laughs) what was going on. And for thousands of years, they used, you know, they, they were the ones that developed what we know today as hypnosis. They were, the, they were the first ones to use oils in combination to attain wellness and help us heal. And, um, and, and also, you know, Cleopatra was the quintessential user of oils and all, all kinds of other wellness practices. Yes, I love that. And it's so true. And one part, another part where you were saying like, how they were using the oils and the precious metals and things like that. And all these things um, are in nature and they're here for us. A lot of people are feeling bad about using things. And I I am definitely a firm believer. You don't need anything but your breath to be well and using your breath to be well is our free and most powerful tool. But there are other tools that can help enhance. Can you share a little bit about some of the most basic things you feel like every single person um, can add to their daily routine to help them experience better wellness? Yeah, there's a handful of them. One of the ones that I love the most, I am an herbalist by trade. It's the work that I do on a daily basis. And to me, they are some of the most powerful substances out there. Number one, they are ubiquitous. Regardless of where you are in the world, you probably can find an herb that is natural of that part of the world. The safety data behind them is really strong. So the vast majority of the ones that are very popular today are very safe for most of us to use. And they help us. They have an action that is almost immediate. 
So if you're feeling a little stressed out, for example, and you take a little bit of tincture of ashwagandha or tulsi under your tongue, within the first 20 minutes, you're going to feel a little something, right? You're going to feel some, some action is going to happen in the body. Mm-hmm. The, the most obvious one is caffeine, right? Like for those <laughs> of you who drink coffee, you take coffee and you feel something almost immediately. That's mm-hmm. a botanical, right? And it's, it's a perfect example of how we use these plants to help us achieve either restore balance, help us heal, or maintain that level of homeostasis that we're constantly looking for. We, alongside you know, botanicals and herbalism, there is movement. You are a yoga instructor. You're a big proponent of movement. Um, in the chapter about movement, I don't not only talk about yoga, I talk about other forms of wellness, uh, the issues of breath work, uh, tapping, which is you're literally not moving, but you are using your body and your hands to help you attain a particular goal, whether it is reduce stress or whatever your health goals might be. So there's a lot of little things that we can do, as you said, that are incredibly uh, are free to us by right? breathing consciously, taking a bath is free for most of us. It might actually require maybe buying a candle or an essential oil and that's, that's it. So there's a lot that we can do regardless of whether, uh, you know, whether or not we have a lot of time, whether whatever our socioeconomic background is, there's many ways in which we can adjust our lives to incorporate and reclaim some of these practices. Yes, I love that. And I think everyone can find a way to move their bodies, whether it be walking or dancing or or yoga or anything like that. And like you said, there are so many herbs that are just in our backyard that we can just like pick up and use. And I never even thought about the most used herb or the most used bean um, is the coffee bean and people use it every day. So that's a good Um, I guess, a way to bring some of the people that are like, oh, I don't believe in herbalism and does that stuff really work? It's like, oh, well, do you drink coffee? Because most people- If you've had a a chamomile tea, you have practiced herbalism. If you put a salve on your skin, you have practiced herbalism. I love that. I love that. All right. So most of us are practicing herbalism and there's so many ways uh, to go deeper. What do you feel are some of the biggest myths out there when it comes to wellness? Because there are a lot of them. To me, the biggest one, which became one of the catalysts to write the write in the book, is that it is only for the privileged few. Mm. Uh, when you go to a class or you go to or you hear about some of these practices, you start seeing people putting, uh, you know, fillers out and saying, mm, this is this one. This is not for me. I need to wait until fill in the blank. Right. I lose mm-hmm. 30 pounds or this is only for super flexible people. or This is only for people that might look a certain way or sound a certain way. And nothing could be farther from the truth. These practices have been, first of all, they were developed by people of color all over the world, including the the ancient Europeans, and they actually passed them on from generation to generation. And it is super important that we reclaim them, not only as a way to reclaim our wellness, but as a way to honor all of our ancestors that painstakingly pass them on from generation to generation for our benefit. Yes, the way has already been paved. We just have to remember, we have to like uncover that history. And I think that's beautiful because I think, you know, over the last two to three years, there's been a lot of like uncovering history and sharing that through the masses, through social media. And that's why I love social media. I know it has a lot of dark side and there's so much, um, just like the world, there's a, there's a lot of negative going on, but there is a lot of positive and the most positive thing is the spread of wellness and well-being to me. I mean, of course, and maybe I'm just saying that because I'm in wellness, but still, I, I think, I mean, when it's I look, so maybe true. I'm blind, but I mean, politics too, I think um, that people are learning more about politics than they ever have before in a fast way because of social media, but I definitely think well-being has, has definitely benefited. Um, but with that, there's still a lot of people that are unwell and that are, are, are sick 
And so can you talk a little bit about like kind of your biggest initiatives right now and to really move the needle forward? You know, number one, we know with your book, letting people know that, hey, wellness is for everyone. But what are some of the other ways that you're really helping people um, be well? Yeah. So I am a talker, as you could tell. (laughs) And um, and this information to me is, you know, at the the very beginning, 10 years ago, I was just like, I'm just going to sit on top of the soapbox and just listen to, you know, and and talk and hope that somebody will listen. But as you said, with the with the developments of social media and at the way that we can communicate now and spread the word far and wide, it became very obvious, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, that. I was also not reaching the people that I believed need this information the most. So I created the Reclaiming Wellness Initiative. It's an educational initiative that essentially teaches people how to use some of these practices. So I do cooking classes, how to use herbal medicine, how to prepare your own medicine at home. And I do it for free or very low uh, entry fee, mostly to nonprofits and educational organizations Mm -hmm. as a way to to give back and spread the word. And, you know, I'm just one, right? I can only go so far, but almost every one of us can do a little bit. There are chances are somebody in your community will have a great, you know, nonprofit that is working to, you know, deal with some of the issues related to, you know, food deserts or lack of information about health and wellness practices. Maybe you want to volunteer for that organization in your community, or perhaps you want to bring, if you happen to work for an, a nonprofit or an educational facility and you want to connect with me about bringing some of these classes, you can do that too. Uh, there's a lot that can be done uh, because there's a lot of need, as you said. This, but I, I love the fact that people are waking up. Right? Mm-hmm. The one good thing this pandemic has taught us is number one, to give each other grace and patience. And number two, to, to understand that we're not alone, that we're not living in a silo. We're part of a community. And the health of the community will impact the health of the individual. So it is to our, all of our benefits to help our communities be better. Yes. And I think that's so important. I want to kind of dive into that a little bit uh, when it comes to community, because like you said, that's a big element of well-being. But we've been separated from each other for like two and a half years, you know. And so what do you think is the best way right now for people to start rebuilding and finding a sense of community? Yeah, that's a great question. There is a uh, chapter in the book about music and community. I tend to group the two. I can explain later if you need me to why, but the concept of community that I follow is a South African concept called Ubuntu. And it's relatively similar for those of you who may not have heard about Ubuntu. It's closer to the concept of Namaste. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you are because I am or you are, you know, your, your wonder, your beauty, your, you know, your, your amazingness is part of you. Uh, it's part of you as much as it is part of me and vice versa. And so in the case of Ubuntu, it was it, it's been around for many, many decades, but it became popular immediately after the apartheid movement was dismantled as a way for the new government of Mandela and and, and its leaders to bring the colonizers, right, and the people that have been oppressed for decades together and heal with the understanding that while we're not going to forget the harm done, that harm needs to heal, that trauma needs to heal in order for us to come together as a country. And you can extrapolate that to almost every aspect of community, whether it is your relationship with your family, with your partners, with your collective, with your work. Where do we need healing? Where do we need to remember some of the concept and the practices of Ubuntu regarding kindness, compassion, um, grace to one another? And how can we every single day with every single action find a way to heal our harm and hopefully heal the harm of the collective. 
Mm, that is so powerful. I, I think so much that the more that we practice, you know, Gutu and I say oneness, you know, and I, I, I think the more we can really have compassion and also feel a sense of responsibility in connection to everything going in the world. And I really feel like that is the only way um, that we can truly, truly heal. And another big separator that I want to get into, um, and it's kind of personal, so you can answer it as much as as you feel um, inspired, but was, is when it comes to spirituality. And Get Loved Up is a huge, spirituality is one of our most important pillars but, you know, being a Southern Baptist Christian girl, I have studied so many other religions and I see so much value in respecting mm-hmm. everyone's unique religion. What is what is really, um, you know, personally been your go to for the religion? And what do you feel about religion when it comes to oneness and community? Yeah, I grew up like you in a very conservative Christian household. In my case, it was Catholic. And um, so it was a beautiful thing growing up to have that sense of community. My parents still are very much attached to that community in Puerto Rico. Uh, Once I moved to to the United States, I started like you learning all kinds of other practices, not just organized religions like the ones that we know today, but about other practices that are spiritual in nature. One of the things that I actually love the most about my journey is the realization that spirituality and religion don't have to be at odds with each other, right? Mm -hmm. We could have a religious practice that has its dogmas and follows a particular set of tenets, and we can be very spiritual and also take from other religions that or other spiritual practices to make our lives better, right? Nowhere, I don't believe that anywhere in the Bible does it say you can only do this and only this. No, the truth of the matter is that you can pray, you can follow certain tenets, but you can also follow others, right? There is a part of us that is that emotional home that's not necessarily related to religion, but it's important to have that emotional home being healthy and strong in order for a spirituality to then be strong. So you hear a lot of people that say, I'm very religious, I'm very spiritual, but then they're full of anger and Mm -hmm. they are upset about other people that don't believe in the same things they believe in. And to me, that goes a little bit against what you are talking about. And it may not be that your spiritual life is, it might still be strong, but that emotional part of you that is causing you to feel disconnected from that other human on the basis of their beliefs needs to be addressed. And Mm -hmm. that is how we then use some other tools and techniques like Ubuntu, like yoga, like meditation, like visualization to help us heal and understand and accept. Even if we are never going to agree 100% with that person in front of us, we can learn to respect them. We can Mm -hmm. learn to see their humanity and help us heal at the same time. Uh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we just need to hear that so much. Like when we have that emotional charge, that is something within us, as you said, to use your word, that needs to be addressed, you know, because at the end of the day, we're all doing the best we can. We've all come from different walks of life and we all have our own journey to how we can get closer to God or love or oneness or whatever it is that brings us to that connected place. And I think you just worded it so eloquently and saying, if you feel anything outside of that, it's just something to look at. It's something that that you need to address and just breathe into and have even patience with for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's such a compassionate way to look at it. And I feel like we have to talk about this more. A lot of people, we shy away from spirituality. We shy away from politics if it's not like the main thing. Mm -hmm. But I truly believe that we're able to give a little bit of all of it and be able to be comfortable talking about it. That's the only way that we're going to see change in those areas. Um, And so now we want to kind of get personal because I know you have a lot of well-being practices. So can you share with me like what your, your morning routine and evening routines look like for you personally? 
So they vary depending on the time of the year. I tend to adjust depending on, you know, how warm it is in the mornings or how late, how, you know, when the sun comes in and whatnot. Um, Normally, let's say it's springtime, which is actually like one of my favorite times of the year. During springtime, I tend to get up really early around 530 in the morning. Um, I do a meditation that I queue up the night before because if I don't queue it up, I won't find it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm too tired. I'll go back to sleep. So I'll queue up a little guided meditation. Um, and then once I wake up, I'll do a little bit of dry brushing because I, I'm somebody with a lot of issues of my hormonal world. So I still do a lot of that to help, you know, kind of wake up my circadian rhythm, but also my lymphatic fluids around the body. And, uh, and then I start working around 630 in the morning. And I always start with a tea. Uh, I love my teas, as you know. Uh, in the <laughs> springtime, it's a little bit of ginger with some hibiscus. I make them myself at home. And then I normally practice intermittent fasting until around 10 o'clock in the morning. And then I eat a mostly pl- a, a 100% plant-based diet. Uh, that wasn't the case all the time. I've been on and off plant-based for years. It's been now 100% plant-based for the last, wow, it's been now, now 10 years. Mm, nice. 11 years 2011 is when I went fully vegan and um, so I do depending on the time of the day I do smoothies um, I do gluten-free bread with some jam or some avocado I love my chai teas I make my own chai teas I just discovered that I just started it's oh, we so need hard the recipe. <laughs> I can send you the recipe. It was hard to figure it out, but I think I have a really nice recipe. So I love it. I take two or three cups of of chai uh, every day. And then I have salads every day. And I love my soups. I love my stews. Everything that is easy to digest is my go-to. I love that. I love that. And then what is your evening routine? Do you have any? Oh, yes, I forgot about the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so I normally work out after work. My work day normally ends around four o'clock, five o'clock. Um, I will do some sort of weightlifting or something that to help me grow some muscles because I'm kind of small. <laughs> and, um, so I like to, I would love to grow more muscles, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, I do some stretching, some yoga um, stretchings. I, I love my yoga. I do it four times a week. Uh, sometimes I do bouncing depending on the time of the, of the year. And then I prepare a meal or my, my partner prepares a meal. He's not vegan, but he is one of the best vegan chefs ever. So he <laughs> always makes my little, so he eats vegan about 50% of the time. He makes my little vegan meal and then he puts whatever else he needs to put in there. Uh, and, um, and we have dinner together. We play with the kitty. We have a kitty. And uh, I either watch a film or some sort of show or, or read a book. Mm. And then I go to bed like an old lady you know, right around 10 o'clock. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm with you on that old lady status. When I'm feeling my best and having my best life, I go to bed at 10 and wake up at 6. So I am with you. It is just so, so good to get your sleep. So, yeah, congratulations. That sounds that sounds so amazing and phenomenal. And I think having that time in the morning, and you're one of the few people that I talk to who does their workout in the evening, but I think it's important to know because you start your work so early at 630. Um, people ask me all the time, when's the best time of day to work out? And I'm like, I'll say in the morning because you get it done. Because if I try to do it in the evening, it'll definitely not get done. <laughs> But if you are like school teachers or moms and stuff, like you have to start your day earlier. The best time of day is to work out is when you can actually work out. When you can actually get it done. Absolutely. Yeah, I love you being an example of like when you can get it in. Um, So basically when you get into like, you know, your work and your job, like how, you know, because one of our pillars um, is entrepreneurship. How have you seen the world open up for you um, when it comes to entrepreneurship in the last couple of years? Yeah, entrepreneurship is lovely, it's heartbreaking, it's humbling, <laughs> it's amazing, and it's all of the things. <laughs> 
right? There's ups and downs with it. There's moments where you're like, oh my God, why did I decide to do this to myself? But every time I get off the of a phone call with a client and and they are they have clarity about what they're supposed to do, they have hope about the fact that they can heal. It just reminds me that I'm in the right place. I worked in the corporate world for almost a decade before I left for to become an entrepreneur. And um, I, it has its pros and I loved it until I didn't. But I love, <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that I can make my own, uh, I, I have control over my own destiny more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, and also I wanted to make a difference. I was like, if I change one person's life, I will go to my deathbed happy and content. And mm -hmm. I, in, the, in the corporate world, I was making a bunch of already rich people richer, which was fun <laughs> and exciting for a minute. And I got to meet a bunch of celebrities, but I was like, okay, now that I, these people bleed red like I, like I do, I'm not really that starstruck. Mm -hmm. And I, more importantly, I was like, this is, this is okay, it's, but it's not. I'm not changing somebody's life and I wanted to do that. And mm -hmm. so I've been doing that for 10 years and every day I wake up excited to meet a new person or see how my clients are evolving and, um, and, and being an, a, a, an example for, for many people, for the people that are coming behind me and for the clients that I see on a daily basis. Mm, I love that. I absolutely love that. And I think it, it is so important to realize that it's a choice. Like you said, you could you did corporate for a while and you loved it and you switched to entrepreneurship. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a figuring out. That's for sure. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, uh, that's absolutely beautiful. And when it comes to one another thing you had in the book was just about water and the importance of water and how different cultures use water and heat and different mm -hmm. things like that. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of water and how you use it in your wellness journey? Yeah, so obviously water, we're 70% water. That's what I tell people all the time. We're not 70% soda or coffee. <laughs> so we need to drink that. But when it comes to wellness, the, the chapter that talks about water talk, talks specifically about using water in extremes, right? Either super hot or super cold to help us fill in the blank. And there's a lot of studies that show how using those types of extremes will help us with many benefits, reduce inflammation, increase energy, help us, you know, reduce pain and discomfort and, and eventually help us heal. The ancient Egyptians, those Northern Africans were <laughs> pioneers. They were using water. They were obsessed with cleanliness. I mean, I also learned that the ancient Egyptians had, well, they were the first ones to have bathrooms in their homes mm -hmm. and they bathed three or four times a day. So this stuff was incredibly important to them. They actually passed it on to the people in Europe who then is spread all over the world. They've been using water to help us at, achieve um, health and wellness for a millennia. And even beyond the, this part of the old world, if you go to places like the new world, South America, the shamans of South America, the ancient Incas were using water. The ancient Aztecs were using water. So the people that were our ancestors in what is now Mexico, the United States and Canada have been using water. Even today is actually really popular in some wellness circles where we actually take, you know, some of these practices and now we call them something fancy but they don't have to really be fancy They're, they've been around for many many hundreds of years I agree it is so important and I think also like a lot of people uh, in the wellness industry where groups of people are like you know well I don't shower for like a day or two because they say if you shower you you wash the vitamin d off and things like <laughs> that and I definitely want to hear your opinion on that but my thing is like a lot of times it's not the water or the shower it's the soaps that you're using and like the toxic products can you talk a little bit about um your beliefs about that specific thing and and your ideas about toxic yeah you know for every expert out there there's an opinion about how often you should water you should bathe 
and what happens after you bathe. I am a firm believer that you need to use natural ingredients. Your skin is your largest elimination organ and it's also your largest absorption organ. It's like a second stomach. 20% of what goes inside your body goes through your, even your body through your skin. So using oils or oil-based you know, bath soaps instead of those hard soaps that you find in the regular supermarket or the pharmacy is step number one. You can use a, sh a shower filter. I personally use a shower filter. I, it's been years since the last time I shower with just regular water. The filters will cost you just, it might be a little bit of an investment, but it will last you six months. Mm -hmm. And you will notice the difference in your hair, in your skin. And then once you're done with that shower, make sure that you moisturize and use a natural based moisturizer. It could be water-based or oil-based. I love my oils, as you know. <laughs> I tend to use a, a base oil. So in the summertime, I use coconut oil, which is cooling. In the wintertime, I use sesame oil because it's warming. And mm -hmm. you can do that anywhere in the world, regardless of, of where you are. And then maybe add a couple of essential oils, depending on what you're looking to attain. And then moisturize. As you know, as a Black woman, we have been, you know, from the time we were like this little, our mamas were like, I remember there's three of us in the household and my mom would stand us right next to each other and we'll get a chunk of oil or moisturizer and we'll just like pass it on. And then she was like, just go ahead and spread it. And the three of us would be like spreading all of our moisturizer and getting all moisture. So I've been moisturizing since I was like, since before I can remember. And I, I, um, it's critical. I believe that you, your skin will thank you. You will absorb amazing nutrients through your skin. So make sure that you don't push harsh chemicals, harsh perfumes. You can use essential oils and base oils for the rest of your life. Ashe. And I think that's one of the keys of, um, you know, we have all these creams and stuff for anti-aging. I'm like, oil. Secret is yeah, oil. What happened to it? Again, oil. <laughs> <laughs> oil. I even try to use some of these. It's like, oh, let me try it out. Let me see if this works. I'm like, nah, nothing's better than vitamin E, you know? So, yeah, um, yeah it's, it's just so funny. And thank you so much for, for saying that because I think people need those just basic tips like use oil. You can say, I'm, I'm really oily now. For those who can't see or not listening, you got to check out the YouTube video because I just <laughs> popped out the shower and just oil. Yeah, you know, like, you know, the stories that they tell you like black people don't crack i mean we do crack eventually but <laughs> the main reason why it's it's because if you go to africa these women use shea butter and they use you know argan oil and they've been passing that on from generation to generation and their skin is just the thing of beauty. And so let's just go back to that. Let's just remember what works for some people is going to work for us too. Yeah, 100%. And I agree. And it was so funny because it doesn't matter who you are, when you're using a lot of oils, your skin is going to be healthier, huh. better, more hydrated. Elastic. And when your skin is more hydrated, it's, yeah, it's less likely to crack. So we gave, we gave in all the secrets away. We're giving all the secrets away. Awesome. And so what is your favorite part of your book? I, I, I've mentioned some of my favorite parts. What is your favorite part of the book? I think my favorite part is the part about uh, herbs because it also happens to be the part about herbs and the part about the plant-based diet are the, the longest chapters because it is the work that I do as a nutrition educator and as an herbalist. But I, I am so enamored with plants and botanicals especially. And I, I believe that we're not using them to the best of their potential and for our own benefit. So I encourage people to look at their ch at that chapter or just simply, you know, you can all, only benefit from Google so much, right? Like Google is a great assistant, but it's also, you can use it with trepidation. But there's a lot of information out there that is very valuable about how to use some of these plants. So if your issue is hormonal disruption or your issue is indigestion on a regular basis, chances are you're going to find something in the plant world that's going to help reduce your symptoms and feel better. And then once you become a convert, 
it'll be a lot easier to change some diet habits. I mean, I talk a lot in the book about my own journey to, to plant-based living mm-hmm. because it wasn't easy. I grew up with pork chops <laughs> and I <laughs> love them and I still miss them. People ask me all the time and I'm like, yeah, of course I miss them. I just know enough now not to consume them, but I also don't want to proselytize. My interest is in inspiring you and getting you excited to be empowered, to try it'll, try a little bit more colors in your diet and maybe reduce a little bit more of that animal flesh and see how your body reacts. And if it works for you, then keep incorporating more plants into your diet until you reach your goal. I love that. Absolutely. I, and I think that's the way to go. Just a little bit at a time. Maybe you eat one plant-based meal a day, or maybe you do a green juice a day. Um, and then just see how see how it enhances your life. Um, and because herbalism is your favorite, what would you say are the top five herbs? I know this put you on the spot, but what are the top five herbs you feel everyone would benefit from having in their house? Okay. Uh, this is a very hard question to answer because I love them all, but <laughs> I, I always pick the ones that are easiest to find for people and the ones that are the, the, the strongest in terms of action. Uh, ginger, you've heard me talk about it. It's incredible. It's an analgesic. It, it's warming and grounding. It's just, it, it should be in your kitchen at all times, the roots. And you mm-hmm. can make teas from it or you can buy them already pre-made. I love my fennel seeds. Fennels are, it's just a great spectrum. It helps you reduce gas and inflammation. It helps you absorb nutrients a little bit better. Um, Around this time of the year, I love Tulsi. This is an Ayurvedic plant. It's also known as holy basil. And it's known as holy basil because it's considered holy in Ayurveda. So it's a great adaptogen. It helps you reduce stress. Along with Tulsi, there's another one called Ashwagandha, mm-hmm. which is another one that is uh, it's a little bit more of a, um, it's another adaptogen, but it's also, um, it helps you increase energy and, and focus. So for those people that are overwhelmed, not necessarily depressed, but overwhelmed and just need to focus while at the same time keeping themselves calm. It also increases blood flow to certain parts of the body. So it's great while you're feeling overwhelmed to do a breathing exercise while you take your ashwagandha. And then let's see. And I guess I'll say the fifth one is, Probably, I'll say Shadavari. Shadavari is for the ladies listening. It's a plant, it's a quintessential herb plant for the reproductive system in Ayurveda. So it helps if you're trying to become pregnant. If you have already given birth and you're trying to increase your uh, milk flow help you helps you cleanse and kind of get get rid of that pregnancy energy and help your body restore back after giving birth. It helps reduce symptoms of perimenopause and, me- and menopause. I mean, it just helps you at all moments in life, right? From your first menses all the way to menopause. I love, love, love my shot of RA and um, I recommend you try it too. I'm going to try it because that's the only one out of the five that I haven't tried. And now that you've given us these tips, can you name like four more for just us women? Because I, I know I start taking red raspberry every day. Um, but what are, let's say, let's say just four more that we as women should make sure we have in our um, kitchen. Sure. So by the way, be careful with Shadavari. It will make you nice and, you know, feminine and gets your blood flowing. So <laughs> if you have a partner, your partner will thank you. So it'll mm-hmm. just make you nice and, and happy. Let's let's say. So four other herbs for women. Uh, there's one from traditional Chinese medicine called Dong Kwai. Mm-hmm. It helps increase the flow of the Xi. So for those women who don't have a lot of flow in their menstrual cycle, it helps you kind of like increase that flow. It helps increase flow of the Xi of that energy pretty much anywhere around the body. You mentioned red raspberry. So I think I'm just going to maybe skip it for now. Let's see. Would there be others for women? There's, there is motherwort. Mm -hmm. which is great for people struggling with perimenopause and menopause. It it mends a broken heart. 
That's why it's called mother word. And it is um, really great for people who are struggling with grief for whatever grief, the, a loss of anything, say you're losing your menses or you're losing a partner or you're losing a child. They were giving, it was given to mothers when they lost babies, when the babies didn't, didn't make it uh, to help them deal with grief. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned red raspberry. Oh, another one that would be great. You probably know nettles. Yeah, I was just I was just thinking nettle. Like I love like nettle for me. Like I could take that every day, and it keeps yeah. me on like one hundred. It's a great tonic for the respiratory system, but it's also great for the urinary tract. For mm -hmm. your the men in your world, in your it will be great for their their reproductive system, but it will help women's reproductive system too because our reproductive system is very much attached to our um, urinary tract and our digestive tract because <laughs> mm -hmm. we are you know that's that's what happens we are a little special, and then I guess the the one the other one that I wanted to mention is not quite an herb it's actually a fungi. They are in their own little world. Um, it, and I love, uh, it's called turkey tail. Turkey mm -hmm. tail is a type of fungi. Uh, it's been studied now to support women's reproductive system, especially our breasts. I think there was a study done with women with stage two to stage three breast cancer, mm -hmm. including the, the Paul Stamets, which is this really well-known mycologist who was providing the plant, the, the fungi for the study. And his mother was actually in the study and she had stage four breast cancer. And after taking turkey tail for eight weeks, I believe, don't quote me on that, it, uh, there was no sign of tumors in her breasts. She was in her 80s and she lived 11 years after that. Wow, that's incredible. Truly incredible. So uh, you can use it if you are the kind that has fibrocystic breasts. If I, mm -hmm. like I, for example, had uh, cysts in my breast. So I took turkey tail for a few weeks and I also use oils to help me kind of like dissolve some of the cysts. And I absolutely loved it. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited. And I like to ask people the question at the end um, of the podcast is if you, what is two questions? Number one, what is the favorite book you've read outside of yours <laughs> in the last year? Yeah. The, the, fav the book that has stayed with me the most, so I read a lot, is um, it's called Cast by Isabel mm -hmm. Wilkerson. It's an incredible study of uh, the relationship between race in America. And it is really powerful. I recommend everybody reading it. Me too. It is so powerful. And I think that also helps you understand and have more compassion yeah. and respect for other people and races and cultures and things like that. So Absolutely. Yep. Such a great one. And then the last question is, if you could wake up tomorrow and it was Javanka's world, what would it look like? <laughs> if it was Javanka's world, I would... Um, create cities where people can buy homes with enough outside space, like enough of a yard that you can have your own garden. Mm. And you learn how to make, how to grow your own foods, how to come, go back to communion with nature, learn where the food comes from, uh, bring your family together once a week or once a month. And, and cook all that, those foods that you've been growing and, and go back to that sense of community. That's my goal for myself. And if I had all the money in the world, I would literally do that. I would go from city to city, making little mini cities like that. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being on the Get Loved Up podcast. Thank you so much for all of your wisdom and your grace and just everything that you are. I cannot wait to see you in person and give you a big hug. Um, <laughs> can you let everyone know where they can find your book and where they can find more information and even work with you? Sure. So I am everywhere online. You can just type in my name, Jovan Casiares, and you'll find me pretty much on all social media platforms. My website happens to also be my full name, jovancasiares.com. And the book is available everywhere books are sold. 
Um, this was two years of hard work, so I'm really, really <laughs> proud of it. I feel like the book is a a gift for, to my ancestors, a way of honoring my ancestors. And I trust that whoever picks up a copy of the book also feel like I was honoring their ancestors with it. Mm, well, I definitely felt that way. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you and your book and your offerings to the world. And thank all of you for tuning in. Thank you so much for every single episode, um, letting us know how you feel, what you thought, like what you liked and didn't like. If you haven't yet left a review, please leave us a review. We love, love, love reading those. And find us on social. Uh, let us know your favorite takeaways. Tag Javanka and myself and let us know what really resonated with you within this episode. And until next time, love yourself, love others, and love the world one day at a time, one breath at a time. Peace and love. I just want to take a moment to say thank you for being part of the Get Loved Up community. I like to share topics and people making a positive impact in the world, and your feedback means the world to me. If you haven't already left a review, please leave a five-star review and let me know what you want to hear more of on the show. I'm here for you, and together, we're making the world a better place, one day at a time, one show at a time. Thank you for listening.